Okay, let's go ahead and begin. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Small Businesses Big Moment. I'm Kennedy Smith. I'm a senior researcher with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Independent Business Initiative. ILSR is a national nonprofit organization that helps communities build strong, resilient local economies by challenging corporate concentration and creating community-scaled and local-driven strategies. And I'm a former director of the National Main Street Center, whose Main Street America program is our partner for today's webinar. Throughout the pandemic, cities and counties of all sizes have been making relief grants to small businesses to help, off, to help offset sales that small businesses have lost, help them operate safely, and help them stay alive. And some communities have already announced plans to use some of their ARPA allocations to offer more relief grants. And that's fine, of course, but it addresses an immediate need rather than bringing about lasting change. The American Rescue Plan Act offers much, much more than that. It gives communities a real opportunity to level the playing field for small businesses and create an environment that truly supports and cultivates small businesses. We're gonna to toss out 12 ideas today for how communities might use some of their ARPA money to change the game for small businesses, to make it easier for them to operate, to encourage young people to launch new businesses and build wealth, and to find creative business solutions to community challenges. And we're gonna hear from people in the field who are making some of these things happen right now. These are just 12 ideas, but there are of course many more ideas out there for how ARPA money might be used to strengthen small businesses. We hope that you're gonna feel inspired to think creatively and boldly about using ARPA money to make real change for small business development in your community. Um, a few logistics before we get going. We're gonna be uh, talking about 12 ideas in less than an hour. So we're gonna be moving quickly, but we've reserved about 15 minutes uh, for Q&A at the end of the webinar. If you have questions, and we hope you will, please type them in the Q&A section and the, you click the, the box at the bottom of the page um, and leave them there and not in the chat so that we don't, we don't uh, lose them. Panelists, please remember to turn your video off when you're not presenting. We're recording this webinar and we're gonna be posting a link in the event you know of other people who might like to see it later. Um, and before we get started, let's do a quick poll to see what kinds of communities and organizations are represented uh, here today. Jess, could you post the first poll for us? Two simple questions. Uh, what kind of community do you primarily work with, rural, suburban, or urban? And what type of organization are you representing today? While everybody is voting there, I'm gonna uh, pass the baton over to Kelly Humbrickhauser, my, my counterpart at, the, at Main Street America, our co-host for today. Kelly, take it away. Thank you, Kennedy, and uh, it's an honor to be called your counterpart, so I want to thank you and ILSR for partnering with Main Street America on this program and all you're doing to uplift this topic. Um, many of you on the program today are either aware of or work with or work for a Main Street program in, in either in your community or at the county or state level. Main Street America is the national nonprofit umbrella, umbrella organization for 1,600 member communities organized in 46 coordinating programs in city, county, and state level. Um, and Main Street America, uh, it, our mission is just to you know, foster places of shared prosperity through preservation-based economic development in downtowns and commercial corridors. We're all trying to do that work together to revitalize what Main Street can be, and, and we're happy to be your partners in that. Our team at Main Street America provides technical assistance, education, trainings, our annual conference, and uh, more recently, we're uh, stepping out more into government relations and advocacy work, and that's that's my role. Uh, again, I'm Kelly Hummerkauser, and Director of Government Relations, and I'm really uh, here to support you in developing and accessing pathways to figuring out how we can make federal funding, state, local, uh, utilize better to support, support that type of work and uplift the work that you do. Um, so now, uh, I want to introduce uh, some of our other participants for today, um, including um, one of my co-conspirators at Main Street America, Dion Bo. Uh, Dion Bo uh, is waving to you, and she is Main Street America's Vice President of Urban Development. She leads our urban revitalization work in neighborhood commercial corridors across the country. She has over two decades of experience in urban economic development. Uh, she formerly worked as a senior program officer for the local initiative support corporation, LISC, um, and, uh, in Chicago, and uh, as a financial planning analyst for the city of Chicago, uh, working on CDBG programs and, and other things. And uh, she is on the board of the Small Business Anti-Displacement Network, a really awesome organization uh, that you should all check out, and on the advisory board of the Center for Technology and Government at the University of uh, Albany uh, State University of New York. So we're very pleased to have Dion with us today. Um, we also have with us Maggie Elliott representing 
the uh, intersection of Tennessee and Virginia in Bristol. Uh, Maggie has been working with Believe in Bristol, uh, a accredited program in both Tennessee and Virginia. So Maggie has to has to do both uh, on the border there. Uh, she's been working there for six years and she's took on the role of executive director in 2017. She is a native of Tip City, Ohio, which is uh, near Dayton, and she is a lover of small towns. Uh, her passion in Main Street includes historic preservation and partnerships and economic development. And now Bristol has its lowest vacancy rate in 15 years since she came on board. And she's going to talk to us a little bit more about, uh, about small scale manufacturing. Um, and final uh, Main Street side presenter today, I want to introduce you to Matthew Hill. Um, uh, Matt or Matthew, doesn't matter, but he is a native of Lincoln, Nebraska, and Matt has been a resident of Brunswick, Georgia uh, since 1998, and he started at Brunswick DDA shortly thereafter and became executive director in 2006, so he's been there on the ground and really put into place a really awesome ARPA program pretty early uh, after, after the uh, ARPA's introduction, so uh, we'll be hearing from him about that. And Kennedy, I'm going to pass it back to you, but do we want to run through our poll results then? Uh, sure. Uh, where are they? There they are. Um, looks like about half are rural and then a mix of suburban and urban, which I consider all urban. Um, local government, 24%, state government, 6%. Local county or state Main Street program, 31%. 8% bids. 8% uh, local first organizations, a couple of chambers, a couple of historic preservation organizations, uh, and a few others. Good, good mix of a uh, good mix of communities and um, types of organizations. Um, I'm going to introduce our final three people, and then we'll get going. Um, I want to start with Stacy Mitchell, uh, my colleague at the Institute for Local Self Reliance. She's the co-director of ILSR, and she's the director of the Independent Business Initiative, which works on decentralizing economic power and leveling the playing field for independent businesses. Stacey has produced lots of influential reports and articles, uh, designed local and federal policies, and collaborated to build effective coalitions and campaigns with lots of organizations, including the National Main Street Center over the years. Um, we also have Paula Santana with us today. Paula is uh, an amazing woman you're going to enjoy hearing from. She's a lawyer, public policy expert, a tech entrepreneur. She's the founder and CEO of Glass, which is a software ecosystem using artificial intelligence to power high-performing governments. Um, her work includes gauging with entities like the White House, U.S. Congress, FAA, and NASA to enact regulatory frameworks for new transportation technologies and infrastructure projects in the LATAM region. She's been featured as LinkedIn's top professionals under 35, CNET top 20 Latin in tech, and Forbes top 50 women of power in the Dominican Republic. And she served as a member of the first U.S. Federal Drone Advisory Committee. And finally, Timothy Bishop is the Economic Development Director for the City of La Grande, Oregon. Um, before taking that position last fall, he spent nearly two decades revitalizing small town economies as a Main Street manager uh, in uh, Washington State and another decade as a tourism marketing and development director for nearby Baker City, Oregon. Um, Timothy became a certified Main Street manager through the Main Street Center in 2000, led the effort to create the first of its kind Main Street tax credit in Washington State and was recognized for that with a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation. I've known Timothy for 30 years uh, and I've asked him to, uh, to get things started today since he has a foot in the Main Street world and a foot in the economic development world uh, by saying a few words about the enormous importance of small businesses to a community's overall economy and about the need to make small business development more of a driving force in local economic development strategy as we go forward. And with that, I turn things over to, to Timothy. So, yeah, I am thrilled to be here and uh, to be part of the podcast and to really just take a couple of moments to frame today's conversation a little bit. Um, I've been working with small businesses for most of the last three decades. In new to this position, um, I've been kind of in the same position that a lot of our listeners are this morning, um, doing a lot of advocacy work um, locally to really look for ways that as we, we try to wrap our heads around all of the resources that are coming through ARPA, um, how can our community leverage those ARPA funds to really create a focus on small business recovery and sort of reshape the playing field a little bit um, to create a more resilient small business ecosystem um, as we move forward? Um, hey, Timothy, your, Timothy yes. your, your sound is um, uh, glitchy. It's a, 
scratchy. Oh, okay, is that better? A little better now? No. Let me try something different here. How does that sound? A little better, mic. I think. Okay. Are you using a, a mic, uh, Timothy? Or yeah. just your laptop? No, I'm not. And I'm using my laptop, so Let's... I think I'll just, um, okay. Let me know if I get glitchy then. Just raise your hand and I'll try to adjust again. Um, so anyway, throughout the pandemic, though, small businesses have really taken some of the hardest hits. Um, yet simultaneously, um, I think we've also seen small businesses be some of the most resilient and most innovative um, in the ways that they've had to adapt and pivot um, to get through uh, the, the pandemic and really on the road to recovery. Um, we've seen a lot of resources um, into the recovery stream. Um, not all of them were well suited for small businesses. A lot of them were difficult to access, uh, went to larger corporations um, disproportionately versus small businesses. But a lot of communities have really started to recognize just how important those small businesses are to the local economy and to our long-term recovery. So prioritizing those businesses, um, and more importantly, uh, hey, prioritizing the reason. Yes. People are people can't understand what you're saying. So I think we're going to maybe shuffle the order here and come back to you in a second. Maybe you can play around with the speaker and see what's going on. It's, it's, it sounds metallic. Yeah, okay. All right. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, it sounded fine beforehand, but um, we will see. And yeah, uh, Timothy, somebody is suggesting in the chat that um, if, this, if, you, if the sound doesn't work better, maybe you could call in and um, do it that way. Um, so let's then start with uh, the first of these 12 ideas that we're going to present, which is building a strong infrastructure, organizational infrastructure, to cultivate, grow, and support small businesses. Um, and uh, for that, um, Matt, you're up. All right. Good afternoon. Can, is my, my audio okay? Now I've got a fear it's going to just die on me. <laughs> um, well, here in Brunswick, we didn't really have a loss in number of businesses during COVID. We did, though, have businesses who suffered a lot. Um, you know, we had forced closures, uh, sales were way down, and we started hearing reports that our smaller businesses couldn't take advantage of some of the federal programs. Um, they didn't, weren't sure what to do. They didn't have lending relationships with banks. So when we heard that the city was going to be getting some of the ARPA funds, we started looking right away at could we use those for our downtown businesses. And especially when we saw that, yes, uh, loans and grants to small businesses was an allowed use, we really started pushing the city manager and the finance director to think about having some programs. So while we were doing that, we developed some programs. Um, and we finally convinced the city manager that it would be a great idea. And she agreed, but she said, we needed to offer these citywide. Well, we're a downtown development authority, so we can't operate outside our boundaries. So the um, city's economic development department took on the program for anyone outside of our area. So we have three main programs. You could go two slides forward. Uh, the capital assistance and relationship lending, that came out of the fact that most of our businesses were smaller and had never borrowed money to start their business. So we wanted them to start, some, start small, get a lending relationship with the bank. So there's $250,000 allocated to this and it's in two programs, a micro loan uh, that's up to $5,000 at very low interest, as you can see. And that is for a business who might be considering adding some piece of equipment or replacing a piece of equipment that they might use a credit card for. Um, but then there's also the secured line of credit, the sponsoring business credit, 
which is up to $20,000. And that is a partnership with us and the bank. So the bank will fund half of the loan and we will guarantee the other half with the ARPA funds. And the, that the payments roll back into, this will be a revolving loan fund. Property stabilization is to help those buildings that we have in our area that are underutilized or not utilized at all because of code um, insufficiencies, um, ADA compliance, needs a new roof. So the property owner can apply for this loan. Again, it goes into our revolving loan fund and we will in the end get a piece of property that can be put back into productive use either with a new tenant or a sale to a new owner. The third one is the Brunswick Business Relief Grant. And this was intended to be um, help existing businesses that suffered because of COVID, but then also help businesses in their workforce retention and workforce development. So there's a bonus in there if you hire someone from one of our our local college or our high school technical school, which is the Career Academy, the traditional technical college, or we have a foundation that does job education for high school graduates, the STAR Foundation. Um, and all of these programs started in October last year. We had a flurry of applications on them. And then we realized after that first batch, we weren't getting anybody interested. We think that's because the grants were a quarterly review process. We have just today, the board changed that to be a monthly review. We've made some other changes to the program and I will send Kelly the brand new, brand spanking new um, information on it so that you can look at it if you'd like. Um, we also made some changes for new businesses because new business creation is an allowed use now, which wasn't in the initial um, rules. So we've added that into. Thanks, Matt. That's, that's so wonderful to hear. And I think, you know, what we were so excited about when I saw this initially at Main Street America was just the opportunity to create wraparound support for the businesses, right? It's not just a business grant. It's a business grant plus education. It's not just a, a building grant. It's a grant to get that building back online and in, into productive use. So I think it's a really fantastic program. So we're going to we're going to move forward and, and transition from our first point uh, to our second point, which is about uh, supporting small businesses to close the racial entrepreneurship gap. And for that, we're going to turn to Dion Bo. Dion. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. Um, you know, as I pull directly from the report, um, there is a statement that small business ownership offers a solid path for building personal and intergenerational wealth but opening and growing a small business is exponentially more challenging for black and brown entrepreneurs. So I wanted to start with that because we know that that is the case and the pandemic has shown us how much more difficult it has been for our entrepreneurs of color. So today I will feature several programs. We know that, that I am from Chicago. So I will feature some of those programs from Chicago and some of these programs actually predate ARPA funds. Next slide, next slide please. So this, the organization that I'm highlighting here is Greenwood Archer Capital. And, and, and why I'm highlighting Greenwood Archer Capital today is they're a CDFI, they're an SBA intermediary. But what's really, I think, bold and important about their work is they're very upfront with who they're trying to support and the technical assistance that they provide, one-to-one -one technical assistance. They are very bold in their languaging that they wanna support black and brown businesses in the Chicagoland area. So this is giving you really a quick overview of the different types of programs that they support. Next slide, please, Jess. And I will share a little bit about each one. So the program that you see here is their Pathway Enterprise for Returning Citizens. This program really provides entrepreneurial support to groom and provide access to capital, which we know is very hard for communities of color. And so then add on, add a component of your a returning citizen. So they've provided this new, you know, this new cap, capital, I apologize, to support this population of small businesses. Previously incarcerated individuals and victims of mass incarceration 
that were impacted by the 13th amend Amendment that have served time and have re returned to their communities are still faced with multiple barriers. So Greenwood Archer, Archer Capital provided this program and developed this program to be able to provide a, a path for businesses for many of these entrepreneurs. Next slide. Healthy living and healthy financing. And this is also mentioned as one of the great ideas um, as a part of the report, but I do wanna highlight this, that many of our communities in, in black and brown communities suffer food deserts. And so this program really promotes health and wellness and seeks to eliminate food deserts in low to moderate income communities. Through these initiatives, Greater uh, Greenwood Archer Capital or GAC provides innovative financial solutions that work to provide the right capital in a right way to local food growers, purchasers, or other entities that support the local food ecosystem. Programs under this initiative incentivizes businesses to source food locally and enables them to provide healthier food options. Next slide, that's fine. Empower. This Empower program partnered with the Business Service Collective. It really works to bring back livable and meaningful wages and we build communities one construction project at a time by providing back office support and revolving lines of credit to small black construction contractors. This program provides hands-on support to and um, hands-on entrepreneurs with assistance and estimating and project building that really helps increase their profit and their growth. Next slide. And finally, your forte. This is a partnership with Matt Forte, former running back of the Chicago Bears. Um, he has committed to Chicago Black businesses on unyielding support by understanding the need for more Black ownership of assets. GAC has created a low cost loan with 0% down to help Black businesses purchase commercial property, own assets, and begin to create generational wealth. Next slide. I also want to highlight, you know, how civic leaders are responding to support this historic, support historically disinvested communities. And the city of Chicago's Neighborhood Opportunity Fund, and we're working very closely with them as a part of some of our work in Chicago. And this program does actually predate ARPA. And it demonstrates civic leaders considering the hardship that black and brown entrepreneurs may face to acquire and rehab space in Chicago's south and west sides. These areas have previously been disinvested for decades. So in 20, 2016, the city of Chicago revised its zoning code to leverage funds generated by new development that happened in or around the loop to catalyze investment in Chicago's west, southwest and south sides. It's called the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund. These funds are used to support commercial corridors in our underserved neighborhoods, Business and property owners may apply for grants up to $250,000 to pay for the construction or acquire new spaces and, re and rehabilitation of these real estate projects that support new and expanded businesses in these corridors. Next slide. And finally, I would love to showcase this example, the Community Navigator Program and Back to Business Grant. Governor J.B. Pritzker in Illinois um, joined the Illinois Department of Commerce and the Economic Opportunity, um, and uh, I apologize, in a small business development center and announcing a $9 million investment to expand the Community Navigator Outreach Program. The point of this program was really to help small businesses take advantage of the Economic Recovery Grants. However, we recognize that there are a number of black and brown businesses that don't get access to these resources. So an expansion to this existing community navigator program leveraged, leveraged 13 community navigator organizations and Main Street America happened to be one of them as a part of our Illinois Main Street programming to provide support for small businesses statewide who require assistance navigating billions of financial assistance dollars that were made available through the state of Illinois. This program really wanted to target hard to reach small businesses. Main Street America was identified as a hub to work with our Main Street organizations across the state to perform intensive outreach to ensure that small and hard to reach businesses were aware of the economic relief that was available to them. In fact, there was one-to-one -one technical assistance that was provided to many of these small businesses on the program. Next slide. I won't spend a lot of time here on a Cook County land bank because I know that someone is talking about the land bank um, as one of our big ideas, but I will come back to it. 
after we hear from the presenter on the land bank. Thank you very much. If you go to the next slide, there are a number of resources that I shared today that you can go and take a look at. Thank you. Paula, this is Timothy here. I'm trying to test my audio, but I just have a really um, important comment. I think the work that you just showed um, on the community navigator uh, piece, such an important um, resource. I know working with a lot of our small businesses here, we just had um, an incredibly difficult time getting small businesses able to access a lot of the recovery resources that came through. So I think that, that sort of building the infrastructure for access to those resources, really a great tool. Absolutely, Timothy. And we found that our main street managers or those local commercial corridor managers that were on the corridor had the deeper connections with these businesses and could immediately go to them to share. Look, this is a grant program that is available to you. Let me help you walk through the application process because we found that many of them were unable to either access the grant or find out the resources that were made available to them. So, so it was such an incredibly, incredibly helpful tool to offer to our main streets. Um, I really love the program, Dion, because it's very comprehensive. It's not just money, it's technical support and it goes into businesses and buildings and it really is the whole sort of holistic approach. Um, I've seen uh, communities begin to, to pick this up and do this of, of all sizes during the pandemic. Uh, Chula Vista, California comes to mind doing some great work there on uh, closing the equity gap and uh, making things happen. And you mentioned um, uh, food deserts and food insecurity and that feeds right into point number three, idea number three that we're talking about, which is developing grocery stores uh, in underserved communities. Um, there are hundreds of communities. Uh, Jess, you can go ahead and put my slides up if you want. There are hundreds of communities, both uh, rural towns and urban neighborhoods that don't have full service grocery stores. This puts them in a very vulnerable position with regard to food security. And it makes them very vulnerable to the proliferation of dollar stores that offer mostly processed prepackaged food and that nibble away at market demand that might otherwise uh, help support a true grocery store if one were to open. Um, but grocery stores are capital intensive. They are difficult to operate profitably. Um, but the good news is that communities can use ARPA money to solve this problem by investing in land and buildings and in grocery operations. Um, a community might share the cost of developing a grocery store with a private developer or a nonprofit, or it might give the money to a nonprofit to do so. There are lots of uh, great pre-pandemic examples of communities that have found ways to create grocery stores. Uh, this picture that you see here is White's Food Liner in St. John, Kansas, which is a town of about 600 people. Um, this opened as a municipally owned grocery store in 2013 after the local grocery store um, had closed. The city paid for the building and retains ownership of the building and the business, uh, which helps ensure that it's always going to be there to serve the community. Uh, the city hires two people to manage the store and the profits that the store uh, generates are gradually repaying the city's original outlay. Um, the next picture, if you could, Jess. Um, this one is in North Tulsa, Oklahoma, which uh, is an urban neighborhood. The, uh, you know, the famed uh, Black Wall Street, it lost its last grocery store in 2014. And a team of people really uh, spearheaded by a city councilor there named Vanessa Hall Harper, uh, working with Tulsa's Economic Development Administration, uh, pulled together investments. The Tulsa EDA kicked in some money, the city kicked in some block grant money, three private foundations. Uh, and they were able to uh, buy this building and develop a grocery store that opened last May in the middle of the pandemic called Oasis Fresh Market. It's owned by a for-profit impact investment company with a partner nonprofit uh, that provides related uh, food-related programs and activities for neighborhood residents in the grocery store. Um, I know of several communities that have already announced that they're using that, that, that they're planning to use some of their ARPA money to help support grocery store development, including Charleston, West Virginia, uh, Phoenix, and Jacksonville. Um, I'm going to pass things over now to uh, to Maggie to talk about uh, idea number four: cultivating small-scale manufacturing and local and regional supply chains. Awesome! Thank you so much, Kennedy. Um, our organization, as, um, as briefed in my intro, uh, we are a Main Street program in an organization. We are uh, right on the line and border of, um, of Tennessee and Virginia. So Bristol, Tennessee and Virginia, when I'm referring to, to Bristol, we are, we are one community um, that straddles that state line. Um, but our organization was part of a pilot study for small scale manufacturing through a partnership between Main Street America and Virginia Main Street, actually in the beginning of 2020, pre-COVID. 
and um, different times. Um, and we didn't fully actually understand the definition of what small scale manufacturing meant to our community until this program really outlined it for us. Um, a little bit of housekeeping definition purposes. So you know what I mean when I talk about small scale producers or, or small scale manufacturers. Um, these businesses or maker businesses are, are defined in all type, as all types of small businesses producing those tangible goods. So this includes businesses that are producing um, goods in textile, hardware, wood, metal, 3D printing, food. Um, it also includes hardware prototyping, consumer product design and prototyping, breweries, distilleries, um, and local food production and packaging. So with this knowledge and full broad definition, we found that Bristol was actually already home to several levels and types of small scale producers, but we weren't packaging any economic development strategies around support for these very specific types of businesses. Um, as we know, nationwide, um, big industry is is no longer really a thing. And so these small scale producers were very are very important for our local economies. So in identifying these businesses, we were able to survey and identify the gaps and needs of those small scale producers. And when I say that Bristol is home to several types of maker businesses and small scale producers, uh, we also found that um, they all have different needs and, and gaps to be able to fill. Um, but all of those businesses span, um, including like textile and apparel, uh, food and beverage and artisan businesses. Um, so you can see slides there of some of the, those examples. Um, LC King Manufacturing, um, some of you on the call might be familiar with Pointer Brand. Um, it's a fourth generation and family run business that's been in business since 1913 in downtown Bristol. Um, it's handmade workwear and trendy apparel that you've seen on the likes from Macklemore to Tom Hanks. Um, it's a standalone own brand that's known globally for their quality apparel. Um, the majority of people who wear LC King clothing have no idea where or what Bristol is. Um, Turtleson Golf Apparel is another um, unique example. They're the top supplier of apparel to country clubs all over the nation. Those country clubs then embroider their own logo on the apparel, meaning that those who wear the specific polo from a prestigious country club in California has no idea that their shirt was actually made in Bristol. Um, we also have local makers who do not have the same distribution as the previously mentioned um, businesses, such as Lost State Distillery, which is unique in that it's the final stop on the Tennessee Whiskey Trail, and Blackbird Bakery, which is a 24-hour bakery um, that are both housed in downtown Bristol. And we also have a retail destination downtown that features vendor booths for smaller makers and smaller small scale producers, um, where those who produce leather goods, metal workers and artisans are able to sustain a brick and mortar location collaboratively. So as we were um, identifying all of these different types of businesses um, and, and identifying those gaps and issues and barriers, um, the three most important issues that we we discovered in preventing scaling for these businesses was marketing and sales channels, um, dedicated space, and having a retail location. Um, what we also found was that some businesses needed our help and others we needed in order to help leverage the impact that we could give to other businesses in, in creating an identity behind these specific types of businesses under one uniform identity and brand. So um, all to say, um, moving forward on economic development initiatives and strategies, knowing that, that we had this, this great base of small scale producers within our community, um, was partnering with the city of Bristol um, on a resurgence grant that's funded by ARPA dollars. Um, that's a three phase initiative, um, all under a made in Bristol marketing and membership plan. So the first phase, um, we chose a more conservative approach to better understand both the demand from the producer and also on the consumer side um, that so that we could be able to fully develop out a program that would begin to communicate the extent of the small scale producer market within the Bristol area. Um, everything that we had to offer was not being communicated appropriately. Um, but we also wanted to be, um, be able to provide an outlet for small scale producers to showcase their merchandise, uh, further building that brand awareness. So this is the most, the Made in Bristol brand um, is the most sustainable piece of this program. It's something that we see longevity wise continuing on. Um, but this example, which um, is still in the conceptualization phase um, that you can see on your screen, um, this brand we envision to be our primary cohesive identity to, to unify the different types of small scale producers um, under one umbrella. So depending on the types of wear or um, product that they are developing, um, this made in Bristol 
logo and identity can be stamped um, or printed on their different marketing and promotional materials or on the product themselves. Um, this obviously benefits us when LC King products are being shipped to Tom Hanks or Macklemore. They're my prime examples, but um, I know there's several other celebrities who have who have made the pointer brand um, brand known, um, and also those um, those apparel, those polos that are being shipped to different country clubs to have Bristol actually identified on those products. Um, phase two of this ARPA funded initiative is specific training that's geared towards those small scale producers and those gaps and needs that they have. So this includes e-commerce solutions and onboarding, whether that be to Etsy or other or other platforms, which is of course an effort to raise awareness of what is being made in Bristol, but also increase revenue into those businesses and ultimately our local economy. Um, and then other specific training includes distribution, primarily for those food and beverage based businesses who don't have the capacity or leverage to do so on their own. And then the third phase of the Made in Bristol initiative is um, direct grant dollars for those businesses who do not have the initial resources to get their product up and running or to the next level. Um, the product or the pandemic definitely showed us a very valuable thing among others, of course, um, but small scale producers have been able to fill the gaps where the supply chain has fell short. And we wanna be able to support Bristol producers who are able to provide those services. Um, I would be, I tried to not do as much text. So if you have any other questions, I'd be more to elaborate a little bit more, but um, it's been a really, really beneficial program for our community. Um, we've also been able to pair it with um, an existing entrepreneur grant competition that we do in our downtown on an annual basis. Um, this year, we're putting a focus on small scale producers. So we're able to um, to fully support those new makers that may not have those resources. And um, it's really, it's been a, a great learning experience for us. And we're excited to have the ARPA funds to be able to support that program. That's fabulous, Maggie. I, I love small scale manufacturing in downtowns. It really helps bring the downtown to life. You walk you know, down the street and you see all this activity happening in a storefront and it's really uh, exciting and very unique to the community. And that is a perfect segue uh, to idea number five, improving small business procurement policies and practices. How do we get these products uh, to market? And I'm turning things over now to Paula Santana. Thank you, Kennedy, so much. I'm so um, impressed with the depth and granularity of some of these ideas and the work that is happening right now, because, you know, sometimes we get to overlook and just to talk macro level of the things that we're doing, but it's on the details that we know how to activate communities. So I wanna talk about procurement just because we know how impactful and powerful it is to put our money where our hearts and minds are. Um, and actually uh, government procurement, government purchases, how our governments you know, are investing our taxpayers' money um, is a big industry. It's a $16 trillion global industry and actually it's interesting that our governments that happen to be one of the deepest pockets in any country or city or community, those dollars are not connected, are not talking to the backbone of our country's economies that are actually our small businesses. So there are over 400 uh, million small businesses that have exactly the goods and services that any government agency needs to buy and they're not selling those products or services to our local governments. So here you can see how one of our local portals look like. So we came up with this idea of, can we create these small portals where government staffers can come and find anything they need, products or services locally. So we're making it super simple for people that, you know, they're super busy uh, working in government agencies, especially procurement people. And they need to make sure that they're making compliant, uh, compliant purchases but can they also optimize to recirculate that uh, dollar and to make a purchase that is not only a great compliance purchase, but it's also a purchase that is going to uh, sustain and maintain in business, a local small business that happens to be from someone that you know in your community. So there's a mix of things that were not obvious when we started uh, putting out this program, but then we connected with economic development departments. We learned that they we're doing a great job of marketing and creating you know, uh, platforms for small businesses to stand out and to further um, economic uh, recovery uh, programs and efforts. But we thought that economic development departments needed 
actionable tools. And we came up with these local portals where actually we take, I'm gonna put you a couple of examples. We can take literally your um, a small business directory or your business directory um, or any list of businesses that you have in town. We take that directory and we transform it into a dynamic online directory. And then we transform it into online stores for every small business that might not have a great, uh, super large staff. Maybe they have like two people working. They can start receiving local orders. They can start receiving digital orders and accept uh, payment processing from credit cards or other payment types that they would not otherwise receive. So we're giving these local businesses and small businesses a tech infrastructure at no cost. So they can come online and not only government procurement personnel can find them, but also the community can find them. We landed there by talking with hundreds of economic development um, leaders and departments. They were saying, wow, we really like these local portals. And actually, can you go to the next slide? So I can, uh, we can show uh, more visuals of how these local portals look. Uh, we have one in Miami, we have one in the town of Percival. So we're working at the city level and the ultra local level. They look similarly in the simplicity that we're trying to bring online commerce, but to buy local. So for a community member or for a government staffer, it's very easy to, you know, click, click, click and find the stuff they need. And then for a vendor, and if, I know we have many small businesses here. Um, it's very hard to sell online and to maintain a catalog and to plug in your bank account and to maintain all these things, especially logistics and shipping. We try to make it super simple for them. And as Maggie mentioned, we also handhold them. And if we need to showcase a couple of very successful small businesses that are joining the platform and then starting doing their first sales and getting their first government orders, we're also showcasing that so people can see that People getting government contracts, the small government contracts to start is not a thing that only big companies get or medium sized company gets. Um, the portal has a, a formula and is that basically we're starting with uh, canalizing some of the smaller purchases, the purchases where the small businesses don't need to actually complete a big contract or RFP process, they can just get what we call the small purchases. The ones that governments can do with a government credit card or by just requesting a small business to submit a quote. And we help uh, small businesses digitalize how they submit these quotes to government entities that are complete quotes and that are standardized as well. So by mixing these two buckets of our economies, I would say we think we have a great opportunity to number one, funnel more money into small businesses. And number two, to have those small businesses to be able to self-sustain. Every time we talk to a small businesses, they're like, you know what, these subsidies and grants are great, but actually it would be better if I just get government's business because that keeps me in business. It keeps my family in business and the people that we uh, hire in business. So we think that's a great opportunity and um, we'd be happy to talk more about how to enable and deploy local portals, especially because buying local is not just a great thing to do for our communities is the smart thing to do and it's the smartest way to spend strategically taxpayers dollars especially when buying local is at the same cost or even sometimes more affordable than buying from big chains or even buying online in big um, online retailers like amazon where we don't actually know where our dollar um, is going or who, which vendor is actually fulfilling our orders. So I'll, I'll be happy to discuss that more in detail and to talk to many economic development departments and leaders on how we can maximize public spends. Paula, I but, have a follow, okay. Kennedy, can I ask yep. a question? Yeah, you've uh, got a background in procurement. Yeah, a little bit. Um, so, you know, while at List Chicago, we worked with a group uh, called World Business Chicago, and they were creating a program called Chicago Anchors for a Stronger Economy. And, and the issue here, Paula, is what you just identified. They could not find a small businesses that could service the anchors. How would a World Business Chicago be able to implement this type of tool um, to begin identifying those smaller businesses on Chicago's South and West Side and maybe Black and, black and Brown owned. It's a super, it's, it's so simple, it's difficult. That's, that's the way to put it. So we have the lists. 
government agencies have lists of, band, of small vendors, minority vendors, they have the lists. The question is how you take that list and you make it actionable. It's not good enough that I know that you exist because if I am asking every government buyer, especially if we have decentralized procurement, if I'm asking a government buyer that needs to get their job done to pick up the phone, wait for you to pick up, send me a quote that is a complete quote, you're not gonna make it. And then you're a small business and you have business to run and then government is asking for a bunch of paperwork and you're like, uh, this is not gonna happen. So the question is how can we automate the things we can automate? How we can work with these small businesses so they get a couple of paperwork that they don't have, but they can perfectly get great certifications. Um, maybe sometimes they need to put their finances in, in order. We need to connect them with a CFO that can give them that proper, you know, you. Uh, are in order, sometimes we need to go to other government agencies that they have, that these small businesses have actually um, uh, fulfilled orders to. And we need to ask these government agencies, can you give a review to this business? So the new government agency can know that this small business is perfectly able to uh, deliver this product or service. But the big trick here has been to start with the small purchases. Let me tell you the impact of all small purchases. We talk about pro big procurement, we talk about contracts. 80% of procurement is spent through vehicles that are not contracts with credit cards or direct grants. And what I'm saying is let's canalize our small purchases. Let's not do anything crazy. Let's canalize our small purchases, our $200 credit card swipe to these people that are hungry to serve our communities, that are totally able and that actually want to work. And you know what? When we talk to procurement people and to economic development leaders, they look like every small and diverse business owner that we talk to. So the question is, why are these minority and diverse leaders when they get to procurement and economic development positions, why are not they pushing more to buy more from people like us, I would say, you know, to the, for the, to the rest of us. And it, we think they're putting the effort, it's just that they don't have the tools. So we're coming up with tools and letting them connect on those tools. And we'd be happy to give demos. So it's so hard to explain something that is simple. We can just give you the demo and tell you, yeah, small business is here, purchase is here, connect. As for quotes, get hundreds of quotes. If you request quotes from small businesses, guess who you're going to be buying to from, from a small business. And that's how we elevate our communities and we make them uh, um, super resilient. Why? Because they are self-sustaining themselves. That's our formula. And that's what we hope to push forward here in, in the United States with U.S. cities and towns. That's great, Paula. We've got a ton of comments and questions and people are saying, oh, that's so cool. We need that, that platform. It's a, it's, a great, it's a great solution to what can be a complicated uh, problem. Speaking of complicated issues, um, we've already had a couple of people pop up and ask things about land trust. And so I'm gonna turn things over now to Stacy Mitchell to talk about idea number six, which is buying pivotal commercial property and placing it in a community land trust. Stacy, Thank you so much. Um, I was really, uh, Dion mentioned this program, I think it was in Chicago that is helping business owners to ensure that they own the building and the space that they're in. And I just think that this idea of having ownership of the building in the hands of the business or the community is just so crucial. I mean, we know that space is, um, you know, having affordable, high quality, viable space is obviously a key ingredient for, for businesses. And the, um, the funds from ARPA really provide us with an unprecedented opportunity for cities to use some of those funds to purchase commercial property and to transfer it into the hands of a community-focused organization that can ensure that new entrepreneurs, existing businesses can rent space affordably. And also I should add to really uh, ensure that, that commercial space in our neighborhoods and our downtowns is truly neighborhood and community serving and isn't turning into uses um, that are not useful for the community. You know, this is unprecedented partly because of the, the money um, that's available, but also because we've got a lot of vacant space. You know, the pandemic has left an, uh, you know, an amount of office, retail, and hotel, hotel vacancies that's the highest in, I believe, uh, about two decades. So there's a lot of vacant space out there. Um, there are lots of private equity and buyers out there that are, you know, 
uh, walking around trying to buy up that space with the idea of jacking up the rents later. So there's also a really strategic uh, uh, motivation here for cities to think about how um, they can become, uh, they, they, can, they can ensure that these, these spaces are uh, maintained for community purposes over the long term. Um, you know, by way of uh, background, I just want to just note that a land trust is different from a land bank. A land bank is usually a, a public sector entity that acquires vacant, foreclosed, or distressed property, repairs it, clears the title, and then sells it on to a new owner. A land trust is a community organization. It's a private nonprofit that holds property and manages it indefinitely for community benefit. Most of the roughly 200 land trusts in the US focus primarily on residential property, but there are a growing number that are including commercial property in their portfolios. And I think this is a really uh, crucial trend that we hope to see more of. Um, this is a kind of strategy that can work in both like hot real estate markets in the sense that you know, if you've got places where uh, 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 rental costs are going sky high and displacing local businesses, that's a great place to, to really use a land trust to anchor and, and hold on to properties for the long term at affordable uh, prices for local businesses. But it also can be crucial in areas struggling with vacancies because a land trust can acquire those properties and then you know, go through a strategic redevelopment process that can actually make that district viable for local businesses in a way that it, it's not going to become, you know, just left uh, sitting there on its own. Uh, so just a couple of examples. Um, and Jess, if you could pull up the slide, that'd be great. Um, the first one is, uh, this is the Rondo Community Land Trust in St. Paul, which has developed two uh, uh, buildings. Uh, this is a historically black neighborhood in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, the, the express purpose of this, uh, of this development is to keep those ground floor spaces affordable for neighborhood businesses. And of course, upstairs, you've got uh, residential. And then the next slide. Another quick example, this is from the Oakland Community Land Trust. Uh, purchase of this building um, enabled the local business, which is a, a coffee shop, uh, Asta Muerte, uh, to continue uh, operating and serving uh, the neighborhood. And this is now, as I said, owned by the, by the Community Land Trust. Um, and next slide. Um, and even if there, a land trust isn't available yet, you know, you haven't developed that kind of nonprofit in your community, a community can use ARPA money to buy commercial property and keep it affordable. This is a great example from Springfield, Massachusetts. They've used about 2.7, uh, about 2.75 million of its ARPA money to buy three downtown buildings. This is one of them. Um, and the, they're turning the ownership over to a redevelopment authority. And again, you know, this is a great opportunity to really anchor space for local entrepreneurship. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Kennedy. Great, thanks, Stacey. That's really, really fascinating. Um, we are we're running a little low on time, so I'm gonna uh, ditch my slides to talk about number seven, which is creating a local uh, meal delivery service. Um, I don't think people gave a lot of thought to the big third-party meal delivery platforms before the pandemic. Um, not many restaurants use them. They use them somewhat to bring in new customers, but it wasn't like a thing. The pandemic obviously changed everything. Um, independently owned restaurants um, only make a profit of about three to 6% of their gross revenues. And the big platforms charge 30% or more. I was just talking to a restaurateur in Cambridge, Massachusetts um, earlier this week. And he said that Grubhub is raising their rates to 38% to their, their fee. Um, and you can see if you're only making three to 6%, three to 6% that that much is just not gonna, it makes, it makes no sense. This is money that essentially is going directly from restaurants, cash registers to corporate shareholders and investors who wanna maximize the returns on their investments. It's not staying locally. Um, and that's why so many restaurants have been hurt during the pandemic. Um, not only do the economics of these platforms not work for locally owned restaurants, but the platform's business practices themselves are also bad for, for restaurants. They often include restaurants on their websites without their permission. They create clone websites that redirect calls to the delivery platform instead of the restaurant. Uh, they keep customer data and use that data to create ghost kitchens that then compete directly against the restaurants who are their customers. Um, so it isn't surprising that during the pandemic, a lot of locally owned delivery platforms popped up to offer a better deal to restaurants. Um, some of them operate like co-ops. There's one in Lexington, Kentucky called Delivery Co-op uh, that is a co-op owned by the restaurants and the delivery staff. Uh, customers pay a $25 a month membership fee and they get unlimited deliveries for that. Um, the drivers get full health benefits after three months of driving with them and then ownership uh, after a year. 
Some assign most or all of the delivery costs to the customers instead of the restaurants. Some of them are membership based. Some just charge restaurants a low flat monthly fee. Um, and these services could be supported easily with ARPA funds. A couple of examples from the pandemic, um, Richmond, Virginia's Economic Development Authority gave a grant to an existing local development, uh, um, a local a delivery company called Chop Chop RVA so that it could expand its service area and reduce its fees. Um, Beachwood, Ohio created a city operated uh, dispatcher based uh, delivery system based on their uh, uh, dispatcher based senior citizen free ride program. Uh, during the winter of 2020, 2021 to deliver food from, you just call the city and the city like send somebody to pick up your order. Um, Collingswood, New Jersey's business improvement district um, picked up the delivery fees for a Philadelphia based electric bike delivery service that made deliveries for uh, restaurants and retail businesses within the, uh, the business improvement districts. Locally owned platforms charge lower fees. They can customize their operations to a community specific needs. Uh, they're accountable to local restaurants. Uh, they ensure that restaurants own and control their data, and they usually pay drivers better than the than the big apps do. Um, we have a report about this. I think that um, yeah, Jess has put it in the in the sidebar so you can um, download it if you want. I'm going to pass things back to Kelly to talk about idea number eight, which is promoting small businesses and shopping small. Hi everybody, and uh, we've been breezing through, and so we're going to breeze through promoting small uh, small businesses and shopping small because I think it's what Main Street programs do and know best already. But I want to emphasize to you how important it still is. So some of you might know if you're paying attention to the Main Street American Network, we currently have a small business survey out, something we do occasionally. We're taking a look at all the small businesses in the Main Street American Network. Uh, I'm sharing out the link to the survey here. It's open for another week. But I have early access to that data. And that data indicates to us that the number one thing that small businesses want is incentives, loans, and support. We all know, of course, they, they're going to be calling for that. The second highest thing that they're reporting to us that they want and need is district-wide promotions and marketing. And there's obviously myriad different formats that that can be done in. Some of the things that we've already talked about on the call today, procurement, delivery services, and I've seen several communities actually pop their local shopping platforms into the chat. Uh, can be those things can be expanded through ARPA. So we have the opportunity right now to take a look at the things that we've done in the past, maybe as love your businesses, write le love letters to your businesses for Valentine's Day. That stuff is great, but how can we expand and structure that and strategize around that to really serve the needs of all the small businesses in the district? So a couple of ideas on that are, of course, using uh, platforms or app-based things to do actual shopping uh, with fulfillment within the district. So some of us also already have platforms where we're listing out our small businesses, but there are options out there to use ARPA dollars to partner probably with a technology provider, such as a shop local campaign provider, to help you uh, get those, those uh, apps, not just to recognize those small businesses, but actually to go through a fulfillment process. And the other side of that is also expanding the use of our gift card programs to make them more impactful. Throughout the pandemic, we know we saw so many places have gift card subsidies, right? Help all the small business in the downtown. And sometimes that was funded through private or philanthropic funding, adding to that bucket, creating an incentive base for that bucket. You can also use ARPA dollars to fill that bucket, right? To make sure that your businesses are being promoted. Um, and Robin's throwing in the state of Iowa's program, the state of Wisconsin also did a shop small program with all of its businesses online, urban Maine through Main Street America did that type of program. Those are all things that we can consider funding with ARPA dollars so that we can get more of our businesses at the table uh, for that for that promotional um, effort. The other one that I saw I thought was really cool in Emporia, Kansas, they're also giving a local business, uh, local, uh, business promotional gift card if you get a, a vaccine. So looking beyond the pot for economic impacts, we can also look to the health impacts pot to, uh, to fulfill some of the needs for our small businesses in the community and incentivize both shopping local and being healthy at the same time. Um, so I'll pass it back over to Stacy now. She's going to talk to you a little bit about capitalizing publicly owned banks. And I, I can't draw the connection there, so. <laughs> yes, I don't think I can either quite, quite, quite right away. So obviously, I mean, we've already been talking some about um, the need for capital, uh, the need for loans. Dion talked about this as a major factor in what is a barrier holding back black and brown entrepreneurs. Um, it's also a factor for rural uh, entrepreneurs, uh, women entrepreneurs. I mean, access to capital is a huge, a huge problem. And indeed, the overall volume of small business lending nationally has actually declined. 
I mean, I think this is really, um, to me, is looking like sort of a national crisis, really. Um, and what we know about that is that what's happened is that we that, that that the primary lenders to small businesses are community banks, credit unions, and CDFIs. It is locally rooted institutions, and we have lost a lot of those institutions. They have shrunk. They have disappeared or in some cases never existed in certain communities. And that's really starving entrepreneurs and small businesses of the capital they need to grow and to sustain and, and build their businesses. One of the smartest things that cities and states can do to try to address this problem and to you know, really strengthen and rebuild uh, community-based financial institutions is to capitalize um, and create a public bank. Um, this is a new concept to some folks because we don't really have public banks anywhere except in the state of North Dakota. Um, back about 100 years ago, North Dakota created a, the Bank of North Dakota. This is not a retail bank. You might think of it as a kind of wholesale bank. What the Bank of North Dakota does is it engages in partnership lending with local financial institutions. So if you have a local bank or a credit union that wants to make a loan to a farm or a small business, and let's say it's a $500,000 loan or a $100,000 loan, the Bank of North Dakota will participate in that loan by supplying you know, half of the funds, 50,000 of that $100,000 loan. And so effectively, what it does is it expands the lending capacity of local banks. And there are a lot of ways I won't get into now that, that the bank also backstops and assists local financial institutions and in being more successful at what they do. Um, as a result of the existence of the Bank of North Dakota, um, North Dakota has by far the most local financial institutions per capita of any state in the nation. Um, it's an incredibly rich banking structure. And as we've uh, documented in our research, which you can find on our site, there is a significantly elevated level of small business lending, lending to farms and, and, and local businesses in North Dakota compared to surrounding states and the nation as a whole. It's really quite a remarkable thing. Looking at that model, there are a bunch of cities, Oakland, New York, Philadelphia, a number of states that are really looking at how can we have a public bank to do it at a municipal level or at a statewide level. Um, the barrier so far, and this is a, a thing that has been going on for about 10 years now, cities have been looking at this. One of the big barriers to it is how do we capitalize this? You can do it through bonding. There's some other ways to capitalize it. But what ARPA does is it creates a set of funds that can now actually be used to capitalize a public bank. Um, and I will leave it there. Such a cool idea. I'm excited to see other states jump on this and uh, see where this might take us. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about idea number 10, which is to uh, support employee business ownership. And Jess, if you can pop up my, my slides for this one. Um, as we know, a chain store or a publicly held company can live forever, um, but locally owned businesses only last as long as uh, they can until their owners are ready to retire. Um, transferring ownership of a business to its employees not only helps the business owners retire, but it can also help keep a vital business open, a business that the community really doesn't want to lose, and help build wealth for the new for the business's new worker owners. There are about 14,000 employee-owned businesses in the U.S., and they run from very small to very large. Um, they tend to have greater survival rates than other small businesses. They're usually more profitable. Uh, and they're more stable in weathering disruptions and transitions. Um, this example you see here on the slide, it's a, a, co a collection of um, locally owned uh, hardware stores in the DC met 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 metropolitan area called a few cool hardware stores. Um, they just converted to employee ownership a few months ago since, since 2021. Um, go on to the next slide. Not many small business owners realize that selling a business to its employees, whether it's through an employee stock ownership program, uh, an ESOP, or by converting the business to a co-op uh, is even an option. And this is where a place management organization like a Main Street program, a BID, a CDC uh, can really help. And ARPA money, ARPA money can help support that work. Uh, there are a few good pre-pandemic programs that can serve as models for this sort of comprehensive wraparound technical assistance and financial assistance program to help with these conversions. Um, New York City, uh, in 2014 launched its Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative uh, with $1.2 million, which would be an easy lift for ARPA. Um, the number of worker co-ops uh, in um, um, New York City has grown since then from 23 to more than 100 in 2021 in just seven years. Um, and that laid the groundwork for the program that you see here, which is New York's owner to owner uh, program. Um, Pittsburgh also is working on this right now. The city council has created a task force uh, to explore ways to foster employee ownership 
uh, as a solution to keeping uh, really significant small businesses alive. Um, and they now have what they're calling the Pittsburgh Chamber of Co-ops, uh, whose uh, byline is think outside the boss um, to begin to work with small businesses uh, that are nearing transition points to help them uh, weather those transitions by converting to employee ownership. I'm gonna pass things back to uh, Stacy to talk briefly about broadband access for small businesses. In order to preserve a little bit of time for questions, um, and because I know this is a topic that people uh, are diving into in other ways, I'm going to simply say what, what I think we all know, which is broadband is incredibly uh, important to small businesses and you know, having a high speed broadband that's affordable um, and having options for that service is something that exists in, in very few places. Um, what is, there are a growing number of communities across the country that are effectively solving this pr problem through uh, municipally owned networks or through uh, community and cooperatively owned networks. Um, ILSR does a lot of work on this. We have a community broadband networks initiative and we want to run a website called Muni Networks, M-U-N-I networks.org. Um, just a wealth of resources, uh, direct technical assistance and other tools. If this is something you're thinking about using ARPA funds and there are of course dedicated ARPA, ARPA funds for broadband. If you're thinking about using those, focusing on broadband, really encourage you to check out some of those resources um, that we have available to assist you. Awesome. I think our we're at our last point. Is that correct? Yes. So it's time for idea 12, which is invest in improvements to commercial districts that help small businesses. Um, I'll share one slide quickly on this and then talk very momentarily about ARPA's final rules, just so we can set the ground for kind of going forward here. So just as you know, um, part, of, part of all what we're talking about about supporting small businesses is not just about the uh, the uh, business itself is about wrapping around different services for them. And the uh, ARPA final rule makes it clear that we are able to use some of that funding also for, for capital improvements. Um, and it gives us a couple of other pathways. So I'll talk about that, but I wanted to highlight a few different ways that we could be thinking about this. First, a lot of us obviously did some real quick thinking to get businesses on the street um, to support outdoor dining or other ways that we can, we can uh, you know, make businesses uh, open to people during during the pandemic. And many of us found that we actually prefer eating al fresco and maybe we should do that on a regular basis. And so now some cities are kind of reconsidering, well, we gave up that space for free and we lost parking revenue. And what do we do now? Should we charge the businesses? Uh, there's a lot to consider. We have to consider accessibility. We have to consider a lot more putting into plans permanence for outdoor spaces. ARPA funding can help you get through that, help you with technical assistance, to help you uh, recap or recoup any funding lost from uh, lack of parking. Also, ARPA can go to big projects too. Some of us at the beginning of, uh, of the distribution of these funds, when we were initially talking about it, we're like, we weren't quite sure. More examples are now coming out about how communities are using this for pretty large scale downtown projects. In the top right, that is an alley activation project that's one of many kind of projects about in a $2.5 million package in Rock Island, Illinois. So they're devoting 2.5 million to a series of different downtown physical improvements. Uh, also on the bottom left, that's in Walla Walla, Washington. That is their uh, Heritage Square Park. And they are using, again, about $2.5 million of ARPA funds to develop this entire uh, downtown space. These are now considered possible. We have the examples. That's what we need, right, to share with others. Uh, and the final rule opens that door for us a little bit more. Kennedy's report also highlights, though, we need to help businesses with the things that we might not see. They might not be the beautiful and fun things that we need to represent, but there are things like trash removal and grease traps that are things that we could help businesses with. So I put in a no beautiful image found of grease traps there for you. Um, quickly, we'll turn to my to the last slide here. I just wanna highlight a couple of things ab about the final rule again. The final rule had uh, significant improvements, I think for the small business community uh, in clarifying some of the uses. And so I'm just gonna touch quickly uh, that in, if you're a qualified census tract, you are given a lot more utility, including with storefronts um, and uh, other kind of physical improvements uh, without having as many hoops to jump through to make the case for your downtown. All of the businesses in a, in a qualified uh, census tract are considered disproportionately impacted. So that opens the door for more opportunities to spend that ARPA funding without having to go and find out what those individual disproportionate impacts were. So if you're unsure if you're a qualified census tract, you can find that out. Um, you just Google it, there's a HUD website for it. We can look up and see on a map whether or not 
part of your district is. About 50% of Main Street districts are overlap with a qualified census tract. Again, the final rule clarified capital expenditures being allowed. So you can kind of create those bigger ideas. And uh, as with the interim final rule, the final rule also just says you're allowed to create a solution that fits your, your specific impact. So if you see something in your community, you have to measure it and address it, but you're able to think creatively, which is what I think we've hoped to get at today. Great, thanks Kelly. We've gone through 12 ideas and I wanna come back to Timothy to uh, kind of round us out here with, with a, 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 a condensed version of what he was trying to say at the beginning when his sound wasn't working. Timothy. All right, so hopefully my sound is working a little better. Um, I'm gonna just uh, say most of what I had for opening comments, we've covered pretty thoroughly. So I think in wrapping up today's conversation, um, I think it's clear that moving forward and looking at ARPA funds, um, prioritizing the resources and tools create, created through those in a way that focuses on a small business communities can truly transform the ongoing recovery and more importantly, the future resiliency of our small business communities. So I think the thing that I hope you all take away um, from today is looking at how these resources can create tools that really are right-sized and accessible for this critical sector of our local communities. And I hope that you leave today's session um, really feeling inspired and able to go out there and be bold and creative. You know, we look at how TARPA funds can really transform how we think about economic development with a small business priority. That's great, Timothy. That, that really is the message I hope everybody takes away is that um, ARPA can really change the playing field and we need to not think in small terms, but really think big and bold about how we can reposition our economic development approaches so that we're putting small business at the center and really driving long-term community wealth building um, in a way that we don't get from extractive businesses that send profits out of the community to shareholders and investors in some other community. Um, we are like out of time. This has been an amazing, amazing session with lots of great messages. I get the sense people would like to hear more. And Jess, we have one last poll, if you can pop that up, asking if there are topics that you've heard of any of these ideas that you'd like us to expand on through another webinar or through a, a podcast or an article or something. So if you could um, take a second and vote on that. Um, I'm sorry we haven't had time to get to everyone's questions. We'll try to take some uh, offline and following up with you. I want to thank all of our panelists for doing such a good job and sharing so many amazing ideas and examples of your good work with us. Um, we hope you enjoyed today's webinar and look forward to hearing about how you're planning to use your ARPA money to strengthen and develop small businesses in your own communities. Thank you for joining us today. I hope people are still voting in the poll though. We're saying goodbye, but please vote. We're gonna sit here and watch for a few minutes, yes. Yes, I'm very curious what people wanna hear more about. This is your opportunity to shape a couple of webinars coming up, right? Yeah. What really piqued your interest today or what did you come away with with a lot of questions uh, you wanna hear more details and more examples and really dig into the how-to of. So I'd love to hear from you. There was a comment that was appreciative of our pace moving through it. So that that's good because I was, whoo, that was that was quick. <laughs> I felt it was very fast. And <laughs> especially when we are downloading information into very smart people that have been working on these problems for many decades. And then I was thinking, you know what? It's great that there's a lot of info because people can come back to something and then sit on it and, and reflect on it and go back to the report. So I think it was great um, and very respectful of people's time too. Like, here's a bunch of info, take what serves you, take it from here. So, yeah. I do hope you all will, will, will download and read the report. It has, uh, it has much more detail than we were able to cover today and um, lots of good examples that you can, you can follow up on. So here's our poll and it looks like, um, you know, lots of uh, when people wanna hear more about uh, it, it, that organizational infrastructure to cultivate and support small businesses. Um, small scale manufacturing and supply chains, uh, community uh, commercial property and land trust, uh, really everything has has pretty strong support. So I guess we're going to be doing uh, 10 more webinars or podcasts, Stacey. We have a lot, lot coming up here. I just have to put them in a certain order and go one by yeah. one, you know. Right. <laughs> 
Okay, well, thank you, everyone. This has been wonderful. I appreciate everyone's uh, time and uh, energy and great ideas. Thank you to all See the presenters, later. too. Thank you. Thank you.